Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. Um, we continue talking about particles. The mm, previous lecture uh, lectures actually were about main particles, nucleus consisting of uh, protons and uh, neutrons and electrons. They are present in every um, atom of matter, whatever we are dealing with right now. And today we will talk about <coughs> some other particles and basically their composition. Now, this is a um, much more advanced level um, of contemporary physics, actually, um, than whatever we were dealing with previous. <coughs> and uh, it's still developing part of physics. Um, nevertheless, I think it's very important just to give you a flavor of what uh, many physicists are actually doing right now and what they're dealing with as far as the theory is concerned. Um, so this lecture will not contain any particular mathematics or anything like that. It's more about just discussion about what exactly is happening right now in in uh, particle physics. Okay, now this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens. It's presented on unisor.com. Um, I do suggest you to watch this lecture from the website because every lecture has a textual um, supplement right next to it, um, which basically is like your textbook. Um, the website contains exams which you can take any number of times until you feel um, that you have mastered the contents. Um, the website is uh, totally free. Uh, there are no advertisement, so no distraction, no strings attached. Uh, Sign-in is not necessary. I mean, there is certain functionality of the website related to signing in, but that's about supervisory education. If you just do it yourself, you don't have to do it. And what's important is uh, the website contains a course. So it's set of lectures. There is a menu. There is a sub-menu. Lectures are related logically to each other because I'm using in the subsequent lecture whatever we were talking about in the previous lecture. <coughs> so it's a course. Um, whereas if you find this lecture somewhere on YouTube, you'll just have this single lecture without much of the textual explanation or whatever else. Okay, now, so today we will talk about things called quarks. Okay, so let me just start from the beginning, how the progress of, um, of the physics which basically is dealing with how, what is the matter uh, we are dealing with, what is matter. Well, again, very, very briefly, you mm, divide a drop of water, you split the water into two smaller drops and then smaller and smaller until you will reach basically the smallest part of uh, the water which still retains its qualities, chemical qualities and physical qualities. That's the molecule, right? H2O, for instance, for the water. Or if you have a, let's say, a copper wire and you cut it and you cut it in smaller and smaller pieces, you will reach a molecule of copper. Fine. Okay. Now, what molecules uh, contain? So that's basically what's the first factor, because you see there are so many different molecules um, chemical compositions of atoms in all the... So people actually were thinking that they needed certain theory, certain system to basically understand how all these molecules are mm, constructed. So the next level was atoms. Now we have thousands of different molecules, but we have something about a hundred different atoms. So that's simplification. It's basically the... I, I can make an analogy between 
hieroglyph based language like Chinese for example and alphabet based language something like Latin in Chinese language you have like 60,000, 70,000 whatever different glyphs so to speak right and it's kind of difficult to, to deal with them, difficult to remember them etc. In Latin you have like 26 different letters and the combination of letters combined uh, basically makes up all the different words. Same thing here. The combination of 100 atoms made thousands and thousands of different uh, compositions which we call molecules. So that's a kind of a systematization if you wish. Uh, maybe simplification as well in, in a way. It's easier to deal with a hundred atoms in different combinations than with many many thousands of molecules which we just deal as given so to speak. Plus it gives you an inner structure of the molecules. So the atomic model was very very useful. Great, now we have a hundred atoms to deal with and their combinations. What atoms are uh, uh, consist of? Well, let's go deeper. And the first thing we found was the main compositions, which is n uh, uh, nucleus and electrons. And nucleus in turn contains neutrons and protons. Okay, so we have three main particles from which seems to be all the matter consists of? Well, that's simply significant simplification. <coughs> and it's much basically easier to mm, systematize, uh, to construct all the different atoms from all, from, from all these three components, protons, neutrons, and, and, and electrons. Well, the problem is it doesn't really encompass everything, whatever physicists deal with there are many many other particles not only protons and neutrons and electrons um, well actually the number is something like about 200 which they have discovered in the course of experiments so the system needs to be again put into some kind of a nice theory so in as much as we constructed molecule from atoms atoms from uh, main particles now the main particles and not so main other particles like mesons, muons, whatever uh, which have been discovered uh, they have to be somehow put into a nice theory and the problem is that there was no nice theory so to speak at least not now all right so um, let me just give you an example of um, how people were thinking about the need for this more elementary structure which basically is supposed to be the inner structure of protons, neutrons and other particles. If you remember we were talking when we were talking about isotopes that was a previous lecture we were talking about um, conversion uh, uh, of uh, nitrogen into the isotope of carbon, carbon-14. Now, that's exactly from the previous lecture. There was a neutron which was a result of bombardment of upper layers of atmosphere of the cosmic radiation. So they bombarded the atoms in the um, upper layers of atmosphere basically broke the atoms in pieces and neutrons were flying and protons probably also and electrons so these uh, uh, elementary particles um, these particles not element these particles were flying somewhere now the neutron hit nitrogen atom neutron has a mass of one and charge electric charge zero it's neutral okay the nitrogen has um, mass, atomic mass 14 and atomic number 7 so it has 7 protons and 7 electrons now as a result 
what happens? The neutron kicked off the proton converting into 14,6, which is carbon isotope. Now, there is an extra proton, and it also kicked electron as well, um, because there are only six protons, so the seventh electron also goes away. So that would be proton here, which is uh, mass um, mass 1 and electron and then these two combined into atom of hydrogen so that's how carbon-14 was created now do we understand physically how it happened well yes I think so it's like Neutron and proton, these are like billiard balls, if you wish. You hit, one, you, you hit one ball with another, so the first one takes its place. Um, and so if you have a ball, and you have another ball hitting this one. Now this goes away somewhere, and this takes its place, right? So that's what happens with neutron, which kicks off the proton, and replaces in inside the atom. So atom is converted from um, 14.7 to 14.6 because proton goes out, neutron is replacing it, so the mass is the same. Instead of proton, you have a neutron. Both have atomic mass 1. But the electric charge is decreasing by 1. So it's only 6 protons now. And that releases another electron and that's how it goes so it seems to be like physical and with like billiard balls basically so we understand how it, it happens now what happens after that how the carbon um, decays carbon 14 decays that's a different thing okay it decays in the following way first of all uh, one of the neutrons inside this atom of carbon-14 is magically converted into proton uh, one, one, and electron. We are not talking about how, magically, okay? Now, what happens then is the following. Since it's converted into proton, the charge is increasing. So from as a result of this, this C14 6 is converting into N147. So we are increasing the charge by one. And electron is released um, out of the atom. And some other things as well happens, which I don't want to touch, like neutrino, etc. Somehow it, it's a complicated reaction. But anyway, this E is based on this magical conversion of neutron into proton plus electron. But we don't feel that this is kind of understandable. And in as much as understandable the first reaction, well, the neutron just kick, kicks off the proton. We, we, we see how it, it, it goes physically. We see how the billiard ball actually is hitting another ball. That, that's understandable. How this reaction happens, it's not really understandable. Magic. People don't like magic. Physicists don't like magic. And they would like to explain it in some way. Okay, and here it is. In some way, people were so much dissatisfied with this and many other things in uh, physics of particles. They wanted to come with some kind of a theory. Okay, what is the theory? Well, obviously the theory is that maybe neutron and proton should actually have something inside. And this reaction is 
also something like a replacement of one piece of inside with another piece. Now, here is just one particular model which can be thought about. Let's consider we have two different things. X which has a charge plus one half and Y which has charge of minus one half. Then X plus X gives you charge one and maybe that's the proton. Now X plus Y these two parts will give you charge zero, right? So that may be a neutron. Which means that converging neutron into proton means basically a replacement piece of the neutron, which is called Y, with another piece called X. Is it possible? Yes, I mean, in theory, it's a nice theory. Whether it's true or not is a different question, but it's a nice theory to satisfy um, the electric charge of proton and neutron. Well, we don't have only electric charge, which is a characteristic of proton and neutron, which we have to satisfy. For example, we have to satisfy mass. So, sum of x plus x mass should be almost equal to the mass of proton, and sum of these two should be more or less equal to this. Well, again, not exactly, because there is some kind of a relationship between energy and mass, and if they are together in an atom, there is a certain amount of energy which, um, which holds them together, and there is a famous Einstein's equation that E is equal to mc square, which we are not talking about right now, but that means that masses are not exactly, sum of this is equal to this, but approximately. All right. How about other particles? I mean, if we are talking only about X and Y, two different um, elementary particles, let's call it this way, from which everything else is comprised, we cannot possibly um, uh, comprise from only these two things 200 different particles, which we have basically n known about, which have their own charge, their own masses, etc., etc. We need something more complex, actually. Well, uh, and in 1964, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, yeah, that was in 1964, and who was that? Uh, it was uh, Genman and uh, Zweig, I believe they have offered something significantly more complex, but it looks like it satisfied different combinations um, and we can satisfy the uh, equality between like charge and mass and some other properties of different particles with the combination of whatever was actually um, suggested as a theory. So they have suggested the existence of um, little elementary particles called quarks from which um, other particles actually are constructed. Now, as I was saying, we have something like 200 different particles. Well, the number of quarks is actually, well, it's six, but then there are anti-quarks, so it makes it 12, and then there are some other um, particles. So altogether, it, it's significantly less than 200. It's something like a couple of dozens, whatever, from which we can construct other things. And let me just concentrate on quarks, <coughs> because I would like to talk about only the proton and neutron as the big particles, which basically seem to be constructed from other particles which we call quarks, which they call quarks. So here is their theory. There are six quarks and they call it um, up and down 
um, strain, uh, no, charm, charm, and strange, and top and bottom. Now these are just names. So instead of this, call it U D C S T and B. Just the first letters. Now they have certain electric charging. Let's talk about electric charge only. So the up and down have uh, plus two thirds and minus one third. Again, plus two thirds, minus one third plus two-thirds, minus one-third. Now, um, only these two are used to construct a proton. So the proton can be constructed from U plus U plus D. So two-thirds plus two-thirds is four-thirds, minus one-third is three-thirds, which is plus one. And neutron is U plus D plus D, which is two thirds minus one third and one third, which is zero. So electric charge is satisfied. Now mass is also chosen in such a way that some of these three will give you the mass of proton and some of these three will give you the mass of neutron. Now others have also similar characteristics, different masses. <coughs> The charges I just specified, masses I did not specify, they all have different masses. But again, using the combination of these, you can actually construct other known particles, like mesons or whatever else. So that was a very big step forward, <coughs> and uh, it allowed to, um, to put lots of different uh, particles into a system uh, which basically explains that these bigger particles like proton and neutron contain these particular elementary particles and some other like mesons have some other combination of these guys so that was apparently sufficient to um, to satisfy the construction of many particles now in addition to this um, something like electron is considered to be an elementary particle, so it does not contain anything inside it. And there are some other, like muons, for example. <coughs> so, physicists came up with something which is called standard model. So the standard model is, um, is specifying that there are quarks and there are some other elementary particles, like electrons, for instance, and there are some yet other elementary particles which are responsible for the forces. For example, photon, you know, it's kind of, sometimes it behaves like a particle, sometimes it behaves like a, like a wave. But in any case, as a, as a particle in this system, it's a particle which is a carrier of electromagnetic force. And uh, there is another one which is uh, gluon, for example, which is a carrier of strong forces which keep uh, proton and neutron together in a nucleus. <coughs> so the combination of quarks and some other particles may made up a standard model, which is considered right now as, well, we just accept it, let's put it this way. Now, experimental confirmation, well, that's not so simple. Um, there are certain experiments which hints that the quarks actually were observed. But what's probably more important is that certain properties which result in this particular theory were confirmed. So it's not the existence of quarks themselves, which kind of, well, it looks like it was really kind of observed, but not everywhere, not, not so consistently. I'm not, I'm not sure myself, quite frankly. But what definitely was observed was that the results of explaining this using this particular theory, using the standard model, uh, it predicted certain properties of certain particles, and these properties were actually uh, observed really in experiments.
That's what's very important. So the standard model seems to satisfy whatever the experiments are um, observed. Um, what's also interesting is that the standard model, as I was just presented, you, you just view the first view onto this standard model. It has a lot of theory behind it and a lot of calculations and uh, the theory is a theory. It, it must be mathematically expressed. And mathematical expression is extremely complex. Um, also, uh, what, what would be interesting is, is to combine them into some kind of a picture which explains the relationship between now there were many kind of a tables like these are quarks these are leptons or something else a very simple kind of a view but this view doesn't really explain the relationship between these particles and how everything else is constructed um, there is a one very interesting picture which i have found on the internet I put it into uh, onto website, so if you will, I, I cannot reproduce it here. It's just completely impossible. Um, uh, but there is something on the website uh, at the end of this lecture, at the end, at the end of the textual part of this lecture, I put this picture in. Um, a couple of more words about um, different properties of uh, quarks and other. Uh, particles uh, participating in the standard model. Um, not only charge is a characteristic of a quark, not only mass, we spoke about mass, there are some other characteristics using which we have combining them together obviously, we construct the corresponding characteristics of more complex particles. Um, so one of the characteristics of the quark is color. Now, again, it's not the color which we observe. It's just red, uh, green, and blue names which we assign to different quarks. And the combination of them is similar to the combination of colors. Like, for example, if you combine red and green, you will have, what, yellow, if I'm not mistaken, something like this, right? or red and blue, you will have magenta. So, again, combination of different properties, a property is a color. So let's say some particle has a color of magenta. Then, most likely, it's, con it's a combined from the quark which has color, again, color in quotes, red, and another quark which, is, which has a color of blue. And that's how you get magenta. So the combination of these colors gives the color of the particle in as much as the combination of charge gives the charge of the particle. Okay? Um, and there is another characteristic. It's called spin, which we are not really talking about. So, but again, there are many characteristics. Every particle has certain set of characteristics, like charge, mass, color, if you wish, spin, whatever else and there is corresponding characteristics for elementary particles from which we combining them together we get the particles so that's the complexity of the whole thing and to tell you the truth the complexity is scary well no matter no matter what it is that's that, that that's how it is accepted at the moment and um, i do suggest you to take a look at the picture which I presented at the end of this lecture on Unisor.com. Uh, so you go to, uh, to the website, you choose the Physics 14 course, you go to Atoms, that's the part of the course we are in, and then among particles, among elementary particles, you will see the first lecture about quarks, and that's where you have this picture at the very end. I mean, I think it's just beautiful. I, I do suggest you to take a look at this picture. It's really very nice. I mean, I can put it on the wall, actually. Okay, anyway, so that was an introduction into strange world of particles. Uh, it's significantly more complex than whatever I'm talking about, and, but it's for specialists. I mean, if you will choose your as a profession, then you will definitely have to go through this. But as just a general knowledge, 
quarks is a good name actually other there are other elementary particles like leptons for example but maybe they're kind of less um, <laughs> less interesting or something like this I don't know but uh, I just wanted to know that there is such a word which is quark and from the quarks we can we, we comprise we can we, we, we comprise uh, the bigger particles like proton and neutron which are the most important particles um, so that's that that's what it is right now read the notes for this lecture maybe there are some other facts which I forgot actually to mention it's very in the, the particle physics uh, physics physics of particles is very very interesting but very very complex so that's for only those who really like the challenge of this. That's it. Thank you very much and good luck.